I would post it to all the academics, and I would and I would I would actually throw it in the face of people like PCAP that come in here and they're part of special interest groups and they're donors and play money, you know. This call is now being recorded. A prisoner at the Michigan Department of Corrections, Cooper Street facility. Hello, Aaron. Thanks for calling yep. back. Can, can you give me your name and your number application again, please? Yep, Aaron James, A A R O N James, J A M E S. And the number is 674193. I will take your number and add you to our JPay distribution list so that you're clear on the project um, and also information from Notes from the Village. And do I have your permission to use your name, your number, and your your uh, photo in the video? You have oh, full you. permission to contact me. Anyone who wants to contact with me, anyone that's philosophically inclined, politically inclined, they can always contact me. Thank you. Thank you so much. What would you like to share with us on today, please? I would like to share um, the fact that our government uh, is not doing their part to try to assist to get people home that have been home, that have passed their ERDs, that have accomplished things and whatnot. What do you mean by have, they're not doing their part and people have accomplished? What, how so do you mean? Well, I personally, I've been locked up for almost 16 years. Um, I completed all my groups. I completed self-help. I completed the mandatory necessary groups. I actually got a college degree. I got a double associate's degree for arts and humanities and behavioral science. And I was given a flop, an 18-month flop, to finish my group. Uh, I finished group, and then I was given another 12 on top of that for no apparent reason whatsoever. And people are in here getting sick. There's, our facility luckily hasn't been hit yet, but all the facilities around us, people are dying like crazy in Parnell because I'm in Jackson. So, yeah, I've, they're not giving me any objective reasoning why they're flopping me, you know, and, and they're keeping me in prison. And they know how that strains people's mental health. They know that we're trying to get out there to our families. I have a mother that has asthma, and she, has, she needs hip surgery, um, and she can't even get that right now, so she needs me home. There's so many things, you know, that... Uh, Do I understand that, I, that you were flopped twice? Twice, yep. Once for 18 months and then again for 12? Then again for 12, yeah. And, and their reasoning for that, not getting them. One of their reasons was a history of substance abuse, and I haven't had one substance abuse ticket since I've been locked up. That's what's funny. Uh, they said that I, in my history when I came down, which, of course, I had fighting. I had, you know, threatening behaviors on officers and things like that. Typical stuff that a guy that's angry that comes to prison, you know, when you should treat them for their problems that I had, which they didn't. They waited until the last few years to put me in groups and things. But, yeah, I, I had tickets in my past, but I haven't even had a Class 1, which is the highest uh, kind of ticket you can get in over three years. So there is no ticket history that's current that would justify keeping me in prison. When I become, I'm a part of like a 1% of guys that get college degrees, so it, it makes no apparent sense. The only thing I can think of is that in 2004, I caught two cases. One was a, a assault and a police officer because they jumped on my sister over a traffic stop in Wyoming outside of Grand Rapids. They knocked her tooth out. She has a master's degree from U of M. Uh, we're mixed, of course. Uh, I don't know if that was part of it or not. I'm not going to try to politicize that. All I'll say is that we were pulled over. She was attacked. I knocked out a cop, um, and they knocked her to uh, tooth out, and she urinated on herself. They tased her. There was a lot of different things legally, and um, I got charged for assault and police officer felony. She got charged for felony. She, uh, I ended up out on bond. I had a bad situation with a female friend. I caught a CSC first degree. Took a cop to both cases in 14 to 22 and a half years. She agreed to the plea. The police officers and their people agreed to it. And I did my time. I did everything I was supposed to do. All I can think of is that maybe because they're related to law enforcement, you know, because a lot of them are ex-cops, they don't like me. You know, uh, also when I was in, when I first came down, I was in Alger, uh, level four. And I called the officers communists and told them that they weren't true Americans. And they drug me through snow. They broke my uh, nose, chipped my tooth, and put me in level five for a year and lied and tried to say that I need the officer when he got charged in court in Marquette. So maybe they knew about that, um, or maybe it was the police incident, but they're holding that against me to keep me in prison, which they shouldn't because, you know, you can't use a subjective opinion, you know, when you're using objective facts politically to see if a person's dangerous or not. And also, those are huge uh, errors and flaws in our system. Tell me, please, uh, as it regards the, the, the men that you are in company with there, what is the conversation regarding the coronavirus and 
the fact that you all, well, you all have been flopped and, and would otherwise have been home by now. Oh, people are, the paranoia and the anxiety and the, the mental health is that people's morale is very low because uh, they give us these masks, they're, they're not giving us new masks, you have to wash them in a communal laundry. Uh, people are not socially distanced, we live in an eight-man cube, they set up little lines and pretend like they're socially distancing us for uh, child lines, but these things are inefficient, of course, because you still have to sit in a table. So, uh, And particularly when you're here past your ERD, when you know you can be home and that the virus can hit at any time, you're not bringing it in. They're obviously bringing it in. It's a, it, it definitely the paranoia, the fear, the, you know, your family are crying on the phone. It, it's not an easy thing day by day to just, you know, hopefully they'll call me back or I'll get home and the pro board will, will see reason, but there really is no reason when you're playing with someone's life. And, and in here, the tension is very high. When summer comes, it's going to be even higher, and it's only a matter of time before when they open things up that the, the corona hits Cooper Street because it's already devastated Parnell and across the street and devastated uh, Dwayne Waters and all the places that we go to the hospital for if we get sick because we're right next door. So it's only a matter of time, and, it, and the morale in here is really bad. People are some are real negative, some are thinking like some real negative things. Some people are trying to be optimistic, but it's very it's very dire, I'd say, especially for people like me that should be home. I go up and down with my, my mental health. Is, there's no, no mental health people come around and say, hey, how are you guys doing? You know, Can we help you in any form or shape? No one cares your, your mental state in here. It's just basically punitive. There is no care as to what they're doing. You're just being housed and punished, and hopefully you don't get sick and die, and that's basically where we're at. <clears throat> if you were to speculate um or even extrapolate based on your your experience. Why do you think that you are still being held? What what is what is what is your honestly? Your ration, how do you ration this? How do you make make this make? Honestly, sense? Darnell, I believe it's a punitive uh, opinion based uh, dislike. They don't like my personality. It has something to do with maybe the law enforcement angle. Uh, I was told by someone in power that I don't come off as broken enough. I'm six foot six. I work out a lot. I try to stay in shape. I don't come off as broken. I said, what do you mean by that, broken? They said, well, psychologically, you're, you're too, you carry yourself in a narcissistic manner. I said, so I'm supposed to be broken and downtrodden and have no hope, no goals for the future. I'm supposed to be a drug addict or someone who's just, I get into fights every day. And then you can say, well, let me go home then. So the guy with the college degree, he can't go home. The guy that stays out of trouble and has family support, I'm going to Ann Arbor. I've got a house that's, you know, a nice place to live. So, that, to me, honestly, those are the reasons, the, the main reasons, and also because uh, the two cases in general are the, the taboos of culture. you got a sex case for one, and so they're harsher on those people, which uh, we haven't conquered that in our society, our fear of, of uh, sex, as well as uh, the cop issue, the police brutality, them jumping on my sister, and then I defended her and knocked one of them out, and they, they'll never forget that, because how many people really survive when you knock a cop out? They don't kill you right away. I mean, I survived that. Many people don't, so obviously I believe that's a part of it. If nothing changes this week, if nothing changes three weeks from now, if nothing changes and we're facing the middle of June, what is your projection? How do you? What? Is, how are you feeling? Like things will go? Uh, I'm projecting that with the humidity and the heat, no AC, and very little health care, and Corona hitting here, which I, I know it will eventually, because it's, it, it, we're going to open these things up. The transfers are going to come through. I'm projecting that, just like Parnell, with you know, all the deaths that they record on a regular basis. You know, we're we're at like forty something deaths, I believe, uh, altogether. I believe that. It, There will be numerous amounts of death. They won't know where to house people. They'll shuffle them around. Uh, People will become paranoid. Some become violent. Some may OD on drugs. Um, Officers won't want to come to work. A few officers, one officer already quit because they tried to make her do a mandatory uh, work at another facility that had corona. So officers will probably quit. Uh, Inmates will definitely bug out. Some people will probably try to lock up and isolate themselves in an admin seg, and they're going to be overwhelmed and burdened. And that's that's my prediction. A lot of people will die, though. Darnell, you still there? If I, I'm sorry. If I say okay. to you that it is my strong belief and opinion, I don't have any evidence, but it's my strong belief and opinion that someplace in a room, in a boardroom, at some higher levels of government and below or below, above, beyond government, people have already ran the numbers. They've done the statistics. They've done the trajectory. And they have decided that a certain percentage of people will die. Um, these 
people in this population are more susceptible to the death, and a certain percentage of people will definitely become infected, but a certain percentage of them will recover. And as far as our gains and losses, we will, we will take that as an acceptable loss if we can manage it. I, I think that people have thought about it in that way. Um, in the OC, people, who, whoever profits from your being there, I believe that they've thought about it in that way. They've thought about yeah, it in terms of dollars and cents. What is your response yeah. to that? I agree, Darnell. We got to get to these special interest groups, these people, these people that hide these so-called evangelicals and, and these, these money people, all the people that are special interest groups that are, like you said, benefiting. And not only special interest groups, our government that says, oh, we have a, we need a disparity council and minorities are at risk and, and these doctors in Caldoun. Well, Caldoun, guess what? All the cultural people that you speak about that are at risk are here in prison. There's an overwhelming amount of black people and Hispanic people and all the people that you say are at risk are here right now. So do something about it. That's how I feel about it. Like, look in the prison and, and consider that as a population of people that will be a part of society that are living humans, not as cattle or people that you can gloss over because the special interest groups are trying to make money. I have a, uh, another question for you, please. If there was, if this was, if at some point I imagine they're going to probably shut off um, our communications in some way. Um, if this was the last time that you were able to put your voice out in this way, what would you want to say to your family, to your friends, those who love you? What would you want to say to the greater public? I want to say to the greater public that remember that humans are, are all flawed and we all can end up in any situation. So we have to recover the humanity that, that is still left within all people. And to my family, I always say that I love you, that I'll always be there, that we're misunderstood. People can't comprehend the complex web of, of what's being done in prison and these interest groups and things that are, are the reasons why they're holding us in prison. It's not because I'm an inherent threat because I'm some a criminal who can't be rehabilitated is because I'm ready to be home and be the human, and they don't want me to be home and be the human. They'd rather make money off of me or drive me crazy or sadistically punish me for whatever reason that is. And I like to say to society that, you know, I'm the guy that's going to be there hard at work at the next job. I'm the guy that's going to be there um, taking care of my family that are fighting COVID or fighting whatever disease or illness or, or, or hip surgery that my mother needs. I'm the same human that they talk about when they speak, but they never mention prisoners. That's who I am. And something has to be done now in order to change these situations in here where humans reside because you're dealing with people. Yes, there's, there's dangerous people in here, but there's dangerous people everywhere. People fall off the map in life. We're all humans. <clears throat> Tell me, please, and this is um, off the record, I guess. Is there any person that you would want to tag or share this video with? We will post this on our our, our Notes from the Village website, which is on Facebook. We'll post it on YouTube as well. Is there any other person that would help get the word out on your behalf? I would post it to all the academics, and I would and I would I would actually throw it in the face of people like PCAP that come in here and they're part of special interest groups and they're donors and, and money, you know. Where are you at during this crisis? Where are you at during the time where you, you believe in the poetry and the humanity and the literature and all the things that make us so human and connected? Where are you at? Listen to these things that are going on. Get the word out. Go out and protest. Go wherever you need to go to your legislators. To the you have one minute remaining. To academics alike. You know, academics, legislators, Congress, this is where I would like to send it, to, to really let you hear what's going on here. There's people that are way past their ERD that should be home right now. For They're here for no reason. I have friends at PCAP. I will send it to them. Yep, thank you, Darnell. Yep, you take care of yourself and, and, and tell everybody to be safe out there and we'll get through this and uh, love those that love you and, and, and take care of them, man. I appreciate that. I appreciate your calling. You take care and be well, and I'll add you on uh, JPEG. That's a noble cause. Thank you. I, I'll, I'll definitely reach out. Certainly. Take care and be well. Right, you too. Thank you.